Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Allen. I'm the president of the Brookings Institution. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to our event today, a conversation on international governance reform. Now, today's convening is the fifth part of our latest project, Brookings Blueprints for American Renewal and Prosperity. Launched this past December, the Brookings Blueprints Project is a series of innovative, implementable federal policy ideas uh, aimed at the new administration, the presidency, and the Congress, helping to inform them on the options that they have as they go forward. Through the end of this month, we'll be releasing a series of papers <clears throat> and holding events featuring scholars and experts from across our institution. By advancing big ideas that respond to the major structural challenges and opportunities presented by a global pandemic, the ensuing economic recession, and racial justice crises, we aim to ensure that our nation and the world emerge stronger, more equitable, and certainly more resilient. While the Biden administration is less than one month old, it has already put several international challenges, be it COVID-19 or the fight against climate change or our relations with Russia and China <clears throat> front and center in its work. More, it has taken proactive measures to knit together US endeavors both at home and abroad. Indeed, in his recent address uh, at the State Department, President Biden noted, quote, there is no long bright line between foreign and domestic policy. And that is an extraordinarily important point for him to make early in his presidency. In today's discussion, I'm confident that our speakers will also have a, a similar line of thinking. Many of their recommendations, which I encourage you to check out online, these are terrific papers uh, from which I know you will benefit. They reflect the reality of where the United States makes progress domestically. It has direct effects globally and vice versa, that global developments can reinforce or hinder domestic priorities. So with that backdrop, today's Brookings Scholars will present and discuss a series of critical issues, including one, addressing the regulatory challenges for digital technology that will require government to work horizontally with industry to design more agile approaches. Two, how the US can use impact bonds to rally together private capital uh, to address pressing social or environmental challenges. Three, why US leadership on artificial intelligence is needed to build trustworthy AI that reflects liberal democratic values and extends the economic and social opportunities of emerging technologies more broadly. And four, the need to elevate the importance of global development in the administration's approach to global challenges, of which doing so will require significant US AID reform. So before I turn the floor over to Brookings Senior Fellow, Dr. Josh Meltzer, uh, who will be moderating today's panel, a brief reminder that we're live and very much on the record. And should audience members like to submit questions, they're welcome to do so by sending them via email to events at brookings.edu, that's events at brookings.edu, or tweeting to at Brookings Global, capital B and capital G, all closed up, using hashtag Brookings Blueprints, capital B, capital B. So with that, let me turn the floor over to Josh to get started. And Josh, thank you to you and the participants uh, for this great work that you've done and for today's public event. Thank you. Excellent. Um, am I, can everyone hear me? And see me, great. Okay, thank John. I just wanna thank you very much for your, um, you know, for the vision that you've had for this whole blueprint series and uh, for Amy Lou in, in Metropolitan and her team for shepherding through this work to its completion. Um, so this series of uh, blueprint uh, pieces, as John outlined, is focused on the global governance piece. And we have before us um, a series of colleagues in, in global and other parts of the um, Brookings family who are gonna provide an overview and a range of very actionable and specific policy recommendations for this um, administration. Um, we're going to go through, I just want to introduce briefly the speakers and, and provide a, a few additional remarks on top of what John said in terms of the papers to give you some context. And um, then we'll launch into some brief presentations and have some Q&A um, at the end. We're going to start with senior fellow um, Emily Gustafson-Wright, 
who's really been doing seminal work for a number of years now on impact bonds. And she's co-authored this blueprint paper with Sarah Osborne, um, as John outlined, on the role of impact bonds. And I think they make clear that there are two really important features here, which are particularly significant when we think about recovery from the pandemic and mobilising to address other very important challenges, such as around climate change. And one is the focus of, of impact bonds on results or results based financing, and secondly, um, the impact bonds as a tool for crowding in private capital, which is clearly going to be particularly important given the fiscal constraints that government's going to have coming out of the pandemic um, and going forward. After Emily, we'll be followed by uh, George Ingram, who blueprint paper is called Making USAID a Premier Development Agency, which I think fundamentally says it all and he makes what I think is a very strong case for just the US getting serious about development as the third leg of US national security along with defence and diplomacy. And in this respect, the early decision by the Biden administration to appoint Samantha Power as administrator of USAID and to include the administrator on the National Security Council are certainly all very good steps in the right direction, but more is needed and George will talk to that. Uh, this will be followed by Cameron Carey, who um, is my co-author on the paper, Strengthening International Cooperation on Artificial Intelligence. And in this paper, we outline uh, why US leadership on artificial intelligence is needed, with a focus particularly on addressing the challenge from China on AI, and in order to pull together like-minded democracies to ensure that AI is ethical and trustworthy, avoids barriers to AI innovation and use, and expands access to AI to address key challenges in areas such as health and climate change. Uh, Landry Signe has co-authored an excellent paper with uh, Stephen Almond called A Blueprint for Technology Governance in the Post-Pandemic World, which as John outlined, really gets into what is needed in terms of domestic regulatory form to enable technology innovation and economic growth. And I do also wanna give a shout out to uh, Tony Pippa, who is not with us today, he'll be presenting this paper at a later Brookings event on the 12th of March. So keep your eyes out for that. But as part of this um, Global Governance Blueprint series, uh, they've put together a very fascinating paper on how strengthening US foreign policy requires more systemic engagement by the State Department with state and city officials, which is where challenges such as the pandemic and climate change again are really being addressed on the ground and where local level officials are already engaging in a variety of forms of creative foreign policy, engaging with other mayors and governors globally. Um, with that, let me um, turn it over to Emily, if you could just outline the issue, the challenge and your policy recommendations, then we'll go through like that. Great. Well, thank you so much, Josh. And thank you, John, for uh, the introduction and for your support of all of our work. Good morning and good afternoon and evening to those joining us from around the world. It is my pleasure to share some highlights from my colleague Sarah Osborne and my contribution to the Blueprint series. So our report is titled Harnessing Private Capital and Tying Funding to Results to Build Back Better. In this policy brief, we recommend the use of outcome-based or pay-for-success financing, including social and development impact bonds, to spur renewal and pro prosperity. While we provide some direct recommendations to the new Biden administration, our suggestions also extend to other countries and international institutions with the hope of renewal and prosperity for the entire globe after this devastating crisis. So we begin the brief by introducing some of the challenges that we're facing in the US and across the globe today. We know that progress is stagnating to achieving social and environmental goals and that the pandemic is exacerbating inequalities. In 2019, for example, over 5 million children died from mostly preventable and treatable causes. Before the pandemic, 10.5% of American families were below the poverty line, and 50% of those were families of color. In December 2020, the US economy had lost 140,000 jobs. All of them were held by women. At the same time, funding for social services and the environment is scarce. In the US, state and local government revenues are projected to decline by $167 billion in 2021. 
Uh, in the next section of the brief, we explore the limits of historic and existing policies. We note the critical role that government, governments play in ensuring that all citizens receive the basic services they need to lead safe, healthy, and productive lives. Often these services are provided through public-private partnerships and historically via fee-for-service contracts based on inputs, such as billable labor, hour, labor hours or activities which don't necessarily guarantee the achievement of positive outcomes for the beneficiaries of these services. In the past two decades, however, there's been a rise in the use of results-based financing contracts, which uh, tie funding directly to the achievement of results. However, many service providers have struggled to avoid, uh, to, to afford the upfront costs of services or to assume the performance risk of the intervention. So about 10 years ago in the UK, uh, a new form of results-based financing called social impact bonds or pay for success financing as it's known in the US came onto the scene. The way that these impact bonds work is that investors, often impact investors, provide working capital to service providers to deliver an intervention. And they're repaid with a nominal return uh, either by a government or government entity or a third party if and only if a set of predetermined outcomes are achieved. So according to our Brookings Impact Bonds database, over 200 projects have been contracted in 35 countries, including 27 projects in the US. Uh, for example, there's an impact bond in Massachusetts, which focuses on increasing employment opportunities for limited English speakers through a language and job search assistance program. In this impact bond, there are over 40 investors who are providing working capital and outcome funding is provided by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The US is also involved in impact bonds internationally. For example, USAID is an outcome funder for an impact bond for newborn and maternal health in India. While globally over 2 million beneficiaries have been targeted across a multitude of sectors, much more could be done to expand the use of outcome-based financing. In the next section of our brief, we lay out four reasons why we think impact bonds and related tools could play an important role in building back the US economy, as well as those of many countries in the world. So first, as I noted, impact bonds shift the focus from inputs and activities to outcomes. We simply can no longer afford programs that aren't delivering meaningful results to the beneficiaries they serve. By tying funding to outcomes, we can ensure that limited funds are spent effectively. The same goes for development aid, and even more now post-COVID as budgets are constrained. Developing countries are suffering greatly from this pandemic, and the US and other bilateral and multilateral organizations must spend more effectively. Second, by injecting private capital, impact bonds provide a mechanism to address critical liquidity constraints faced by governments and donors who are currently scrambling to address immediate issues, leaving little funding to invest in rebuilding for the future. Third, impact bonds can reduce government and donor risk since government or donors only pay when outcomes have been achieved, thereby shifting the risk to the investors. This allows for the scaling of programs with more certainty and the testing of innovative paths to outcomes, outcome achievement. Finally, impact bonds can strengthen entire systems by incentivizing collaboration across public, private, and third sector by building systems of monitoring and evaluation and by driving performance management among service providers. So how does one make a shift uh, from almost an almost exclusively input-based financing to incorporating more outcome-based financing uh, when appropriate? Clearly this isn't going to happen overnight, but in our policy brief, we suggest three concrete actions to move in that direction. The first is educate and build capacity. So the most critical shift that is necessary is a shift in mindset. Paying for services that don't demonstrate outcomes can no longer be the status quo. A big part of this mindset shift requires an understanding of the importance of data, and there must be capacity building around using real-time evidence to tailor services to the beneficiary's uh, needs. There are some examples in the brief of how this has been done in the past in the US and some suggestions for building on those efforts. Two, utilize and develop legislation. Currently, there are a number of legal or institutional barriers that make it difficult or unattractive for governments or donors to fund based on outcomes and for investors to invest, invest in social services. In the brief, we highlight some existing policies, including tax policies, 
uh, and make further concrete uh, policy recommendations around legislative measure measures that could support the further use of outcome-based financing. And third, uh, pool investment and an outcomes capital. So the first 10 years of impact bonds has shown that the design and negotiation of bespoke impact bond deals has taken a lot of time and resources. Efficiencies could be brought about by pooling capital on both the investment side and on the outcome funding side. Finally, we note that um, we must consider how to address not only the inequality the pandemic has exacerbated, but also how to avoid building back a world which replicates the same inequalities that previously existed. Our recommendation, as well as all recover, recovery efforts, must seek to help women, people of color, immigrant and refugee populations, and other historically marginalized groups. With that, I'll hand it over to Josh to introduce our next speaker. Great, thanks, Emily. That was fantastic. Um, George, over to you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm going to talk about the importance of elevating development in U.S. policymaking. Two challenges uppermost on the agenda of the Biden administration, both mentioned by John Allen in his remarks, COVID-19 and climate change are issues, again, both mentioned by John Allen and referencing what President Biden has noted, are both domestic and international import. International progress is important and imperative for success on these issues domestically. The international elements helping countries in mitigating the health and economic impact of COVID-19, ensuring access to vaccines and preventing future pandemics and helping countries in mitigating and adapting to the impact of climate change are inherently matters of development. Addressing the international aspects of these transnational crises requires policies and programs grounded in good development which in turn requires ensuring that the development mindset and experience are given full consideration as the US develops its strategy and policies and manages the programs. But security considerations in short-term diplomatic interest often hold sway because the short-term political gains are more apparent and the bureaucratic structures work to their advantage. To ensure that global development fully contributes to US policies and programs, three categories of action are necessary. One, assign USAID the appropriate status and role in the interagency. Two, give USAID full authority of the programs it administers. And three, strengthen the policies and staffing of the agency. There are four areas in which these actions should be executed. One is structure. Make USAID a permanent member of the National Security Council. That's been done. An early Biden administration decision that indicates it values the development voice at the table. Two, assign the administrator cabinet rank as the AID designee Ambassador Power held when she was ambassador to the UN. And three, bring coherence to US development efforts by bringing key programs under one umbrella. For example, joining PEPFAR with USAID's long-term health programs and make the MCC a standalone brand under USAID. Second area is budget. It's important to provide USAID with full authority for the budget budgets it manages and refocus the State Department Office of Foreign Assistance, known as F, from the unnecessary and time-consuming duplicative micromanagement of AIDS budgets and programs, instead to serving as the locus for state's assistance coordination with AID and as the Secretary's primary source of information on assistance. Under the Foreign Assistance Reorganization and Reform Act of 1998, 
the administrator of USAID serves under the authority of and the foreign policy guidance of the Secretary of State. In 1999, then Secretary of State Malin Albright and USAID Administrator Brian Atwood came to an understanding that interpreted the legislative guidance as the secretary reviewing USAID's annual performance plan, its annual budget submission, and any significant reprogrammings. The creation of F in 2006 significantly altered this relationship with the secretary delegating much of this authority to the director of F and the office increasingly delving into micromanagement of AID policies, budgets, and programs. The third area is strategy and policies. USAID and the NSC should lead an interagency process with significant consultations with the Hill and civil society to write a global development strategy, or at least a government-wide development policy as was done in the Obama administration. On policies, AID should review existing policies and draft new ones to reflect administration priorities, specific, specifically climate change and COVID-19. As example, the agency can retain the solidly drafted digital strategy that was put up earlier this year. It can write and should write a comprehensive policy on climate change and a new policy on how the agency deals with civil society. But it should take down and start afresh the retrograde gender equity and women's empowerment policy that was rushed through at the end of the Trump administration. The fourth area is personnel. The agency needs to staff up so it has the proper personnel to carry out its duties, both so there are career staff performing all government inherent functions rather than contract personnel, and so the agency can meet its responsibilities as now a member of the NSC and the ever expanding interagency deliberations. Secondly, it needs to finalize the draft policy on diversity, equity, and inclusion that will make USAID look more like America and be more equitable for all of its employees. Third, for the long term, it should engage the National Academy of Public Administration to design a totally new personnel system that meets both the agency needs and worker dynamics of the 21st century. Finally, we all know that culture eats strategy and structure. All of these changes in structure and policy are fine and nice, but the key to good development, like the key to anything, is having the right people in place who have the relevant backgrounds and expertise and, now, and know how to work together. A long-term step in the direction of greater understanding between the state, AID, and other foreign affairs agencies is an extensive Goldwater Nichols program of staff of one agency serving a stint, a stint in another agency. Josh, back to you. Thanks, George. That, that was a very thorough overview. Um, Cam, over to you now. You're, you're still muted, Cam. There's always one of those. Uh, Josh, thank you. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, Josh, for, for your collaboration on this paper, uh, which is very simply entitled uh, Strengthening International Cooperation on AI. Um, AI has seen uh, over the past five years uh, an explosion uh, as you know, we've all become familiar with with Moore's law, the doubling of computing power every two years, uh, that gets compounded when you have uh, data being generated from billions of devices. And then AI compounds that development uh, uh, you know, as you have machines uh, autonomously uh, processing, learning, 
uh, from all of that data. Um, and it you know, raises uh, all of the issues of both the great potential for technology and the potential of AI as a general purpose uh, technology um, that you know, can be harnessed uh, to, to humans in, uh, in new ways. Um, but you know, all of the downsides that we see with technology uh, uh, in our current society as well, to privacy, to security, to malicious uses, uh, um, and adds power and sophistication uh, to all of those. I think, you know, perhaps uh, a familiar example is the use of deep fakes, uh, synthetic media that that can produce you know, incredibly realistic fake news. Uh, and as a result of all of this, the potential of AI, the issues that it raises, um, we've also seen an explosion of governmental policy making in this area. Uh, the Obama administration started the, at the end of the second term with a foundation for US policies, but you know, we've seen that uh, developing across the world. And let me get the first slide here. I mean, the the uh, first country uh, to uh, develop a national strategy uh, was Canada in 1917. Uh, 1917. I'm 100 years behind the times uh, um, in 2017. Um, uh, and you know if that's, but that's been followed by a rush of countries. Let me have the next slide. Uh, the the OECD, um, uh, which has been a vehicle for international cooperation, keeps a uh, a policy observatory uh, of you know national policy developments. Uh, um, and the, the next slide shows that that you know they now count. Uh, 60 countries that have developed uh, national policies. Uh, and in addition to that, it's this uh, AI has become uh, a focus of discussions uh, uh, in various international bodies, particularly the G7, um, which has established a global partnership on artificial intelligence, uh, and you know, the OECD operates as the secretariat for that. Um, the G20 has issued a, a statement on digital policy, which uh, covers uh, uh, artificial intelligence issues as well. Um, and we can drop the slides now. Uh, you know, the, there are a common set of issues in these policies, uh, particularly uh, for every country, uh, you know, the development of the economic development of AI as a uh, you know, pathway to, to economic growth, um, workforce issues, both uh, the training of, of workforce and the implications uh, for labor, ethics and, and the use of ethical and trustworthy AI has been a major focus of government policy making, and as well as uh, a broad range of discussions in academia, civil society, and others. You know, as well, dealing with uh, the harms that, that can come from AI. Um, you know, a common uh, example is, of course, autonomous vehicles and how you deal with the uh, the risks and the responsibility uh, uh, when accidents uh, uh, ensue. And certainly a common ingredient of many of these national strategies has been international cooperation. Um, and that, that is the focus of, of our paper and you know, how, uh, uh, you know, what the US role can be um, in building international cooperation um, and building the institutions uh, to further that. And the reason for this focus uh, really has to do with the nature of artificial intelligence research and development. 
Um, it is collaborative. Much of the work is done in open source uh, um, and distributed uh, among research uh, labs, uh, academic, private, uh, others uh, around, uh, around the world. Um, uh, it operates at scale. It's certainly uh, uh, a feature of much uh, AI uh, research and development is uh, at large uh, databases uh, uh, that take facial recognition as you know, a familiar example. Um, uh, the cooperation is also important to, to US leadership uh, in this area because you know, it is many uh, US companies, many US researchers uh, that are part of these uh, integral to these international uh, ecosystems. Um, uh, and international cooperation is also important to deal with you know, potential barriers to, uh, to AI development, um, uh, protectionist policies, uh, um, you know, regulatory policies uh, uh, you know, that, that you know, may uh, create regulatory barriers to uh, effective uh, AI development. And you know, in the end, we do not see AI development as a, uh, as a zero sum game. Um, uh, it is uh, for many of the reasons that I've discussed, uh, synergistic and you know, we need to uh, maintain uh, an international system that enables that. So that leads to you know, our uh, recommendations uh, for, U.S. policies, which are uh, uh, focused on uh, on engagement uh, uh, internationally um, uh, to uh, prevent regulatory barriers to enhance uh, the the ecosystems uh, of uh, AI research and development um, uh, to uh, meeting. Uh, the challenge of China um, and effectively engaging uh, with with uh, uh, with with key allies, uh, the European Union uh, in particular. Um, you know, U.S. policy has seen significant continuity uh, in this area. You know, although much of the Trump administration was. Uh, focused on undoing policies of the Obama administration. That has not been true um, in, in this area where uh, there's been a significant uh, continuity reflected in uh, a series of executive orders uh, uh, that have uh, laid out regulatory policies that have uh, promoted uh, you know, federal uh, investment in uh, R and D um, and funding of uh, of research uh, um, and deployment of of artificial intelligence, um, uh, and uh, you know, the the na the uh, National Defense uh, Authorization Act uh, passed in the lame duck established an American AI initiative, uh, an office within the office of. Uh, of science and technology policy uh, to uh, further US AI development. And international cooperation, uh, notwithstanding an America first policies, um, has emerged as uh, an aspect of the Trump policies. Uh, um, it engaged with, uh, with the OECD. Um, it uh, last year uh, after uh, standing back, joined uh, the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence. So there is the opportunity uh, going forward uh, uh, to build uh, on those institutions, uh, those avenues of cooperation. Um, uh, and you know, as uh, the Biden administration uh, uh, moves forward with its policies to rebuild uh, alliances uh, uh, to strengthen uh, those avenues of cooperation. So you know, we see some key pillars uh, to that. Um, uh, one is uh, to step up 
uh, the engagement uh, uh, in those institutions, um, but to recognize some of the limits uh, of those. I mean, each of those has uh, the G7, the G20, the OECD, um, you know, not necessarily all of the right players uh, at the table, uh, or in some instances, some of the wrong players. Uh, uh, you're limited in the G20 by having uh, uh, China and Russia uh, at, at the table as, as well. So it will be need to be a strategy of working with like-minded countries, uh, um, uh, and you know, and to play uh, play the field, um, and to build outward from those coalitions. It may be, um, you know, something like a uh, tech uh, alliance, um, uh, or working through the proposed summit uh, uh, of democracies. Um, we do see the European Union as a pivotal player uh, in that uh, that effort. So um, uh, an important part of the recommendations will be to align uh, with the, the European Union. It is you know, the US and the EU together uh, comprise uh, uh, more than one third of the uh, global GDP, 58% uh, of global trade flows. Um, and that provides a critical mass um, and the EU has created an opening uh, for, uh, for that kind of cooperation by proposing uh, an, an EU-US uh, 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 agenda uh, that includes a trade uh, and uh, technology uh, alliance uh, uh, with artificial intelligence as, as part of that. So the US should lean into uh, that overture um, and try to develop uh, that cooperation. And all of those uh, avenues uh, uh, are important to dealing with the challenge of China. Uh, China has stood apart from the rest of the world in developing its own uh, nationalistic uh, uh, AI strategy. Uh, as part of its uh, model of authoritarian uh, capitalism. Um, uh, and you know, that is a model of artificial intelligence uh, uh, that you know, is, is incompatible with some of the values of uh, you know, liberal democracies. Um, uh, so you know, that really calls for working with those allies use the leverage uh, uh, that, that you know, a combination of the US, the EU, other like-minded countries uh, can bring, uh, bring to that discussion. Um, and finally, you know, we see other avenues uh, of cooperation as well. Uh, international standards bodies, which you know, operate as you know, a bottoms up collaborative, a way of developing policies that are very consistent with uh, uh, the US approach to technology development and technology uh, regulation. Similarly, um, the use of the uh, related use of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, which has effectively developed uh, frameworks uh, um, in cybersecurity, privacy, that <clears throat> map to international standards that that you know work from the bottom up uh, with stakeholders. We see that as a model that could be exported to AI policy development. And then finally, there are uh, trade agreements, uh, increasingly uh, agreements. Uh, some uh, like the U.S., uh, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, agreement uh, has a digital chapter. Uh, um, others that the U.S. has not been a part of, uh, but increasingly um, uh, digital uh, provisions uh, on data localization and others uh, uh, have been uh, part of those agreements. And 
you know, that is something to increase uh, as well. So with that, I'll end and thank, thank you very much. Excellent, thanks, Cam. Um, let me now turn to Landry. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you very much, John, and to the other panelists uh, who have brilliantly presented uh, your uh, papers. Hello, everyone. Uh, and I'm happy and honored to present uh, our papers uh, with uh, Stephen Almond on a blueprint uh, for technology governance in the post-pandemic world. But let me begin probably by mentioning the complexity uh, of the world in which we are living now with the reign of uncertainty uh, with uh, COVID-19 and the geopolitics uh, dynamics. And you, you have seen the complexity of the uh, trade wars, cyber security, climate change issues, nuclear security. So we have a, a, a quite complex world uh, in which many of the technologies associated with the fourth industrial revolution uh, are playing a prominent role. So technologies such as artificial intelligence uh, that Josh and, uh, and colleague have brilliantly uh, uh, presented. So I was very excited when reading your paper, but also the technology such as um, uh, blockchains, uh, broader robotics, uh, automated vehicles, uh, big data, uh, uh, among order. So when we combine the complexity of the world in which we are living, the, the emergence of technologies at an incredible speed, uh, uh, pace, the uh, diffusion of governing powers where the uh, policy making process is not anymore exclusively centralized. We have the emergence of cities, regions, companies, transnational actors uh, playing a real critical uh, role. It is really important to uh, adopt new modes uh, of technology uh, governance. And uh, new modes which should be also human-centered with the critical role of ethics, human right inclusion, civic participation, uh, among uh, others. And, and perhaps let me clarify why it is really important in the context of the fourth industrial revolution because the fourth industrial revolution uh, uh, is explained uh, by the parallel technological uh, breakthroughs within and across digital, biological, and physical spheres. Uh, and in comparison of the first, second, or third one, which were characterized by steam power, electricity, and IT uh, amount order. This is really important because it presents a series of new complex challenges to governance uh, stemming from its uh, rapid, uh, rapid uh, pace, privacy concern, jurisdictional ambiguity, ethical considerations uh, among others. So the, the 4II is definitely uh, dynamic and uh, uncertain, uh, bring a dynamic and uncertain context where technological developments combined with economic, social, and environmental shifts uh, may rapidly uh, make more prescriptive approaches of regulation outdated. And, and this is the core of the uh, problem. So too often regulation struggle to keep pace with innovation. So new ideas, products, and uh, business model are hampered while the citizens uh, are left with outdated prediction. And as governments seek to build back better following the COVID-19 pandemic, a more agile innovation enabling approach to regulation is needed. So our report represent uh, a blueprint for regulatory reform offices to introduce a more innovation uh, enabling approach to regulation across uh, government and says the opportunity of technological change. So systematic measures are needed to enhance foresight, uh, focus, regulation on outcomes, create space 
uh, to experiment, harness data to target interventions, leverage the role of the private sector, bring about a seamless regulatory landscape and tackle barriers to trade and cooperation. So as pointed out, a few core challenges. You have the information asymmetry, we have the pacing problem, and we have the coordination uh, problems. So the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the weaknesses of regulatory systems designated with the past uh, in mind. Uh, and here, government around the world had to really rewrite rules uh, in order to allow their citizens to benefit from innovation such as telemedicine, drone delivery, and to help your economy adapt uh, to many disruptions the pandemic has caused. In, case, in, in the context of drone uh, delivery, for example, the government of Rwanda has partnered uh, medicines delivery to drone when the company Zipline, which was created in California, uh, was not able to operate uh, initially, but uh, working with the government of uh, 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 Rwanda in an agile uh, governance uh, framework, uh, the company uh, was able to operate and to provide core solutions to major local challenges such as infrastructure uh, amount order. Bearing this in mind, uh, we believe that uh, regula as regulators around the world seek to respond to technological innovation uh, seven pillars of good uh, practice can be identified. So the first one, anticipate innovation and its implication. Regulators that are able to anticipate innovation and disruption are better positioned to seize the opportunity of technological innovation while minimizing risk. And governments such as Canada, Singapore, Sweden, uh, the UK are really investing in uh, regulatory foresight to help understand what the future will look like and prepare accordingly. So a second factor is to really focus on regulations uh, or focus regulations on outcomes. And here, excessively prescriptive procedural regulation can rapidly become obsolete as new ideas, product and business models emerge. So uh, the government should definitively introduce presumption that regulation should focus on, uh, on the achievement of outcomes rather than simply prescribe uh, uh, the the use of specific inputs and processes. So the idea is to really uh, enable businesses to, to innovate um, in how they achieve regulatory goals. But of course, while ensuring uh, compliance, the third factor is to really create the space to experiment. So regulator that engage with technological development are better able to shape its evolution and learn about how your own regulatory approach needs to adapt. So for example, in the last decade, regulators in over 50 jurisdictions have introduced mechanisms such as uh, the regulatory sandboxes to enable innovators to get advice on the regulatory implication of your ideas and potentially trial them under regulatory supervisions. And here also countries such as Canada, Denmark, or Germany, and Japan, and Italy, Singapore, among others, uh, are leading the way. So uh, of course, the idea of experimentation or regulatory experiment experimentation should be organized in a uh, representative and well-coordinated environment. So the fourth point is here, also the use of data to target interventions. Data-driven technologies are not just transforming business. They can also revolutionize regulatory uh, practices and regulation too. So regulators have access to more ways to gather and analyze data than ever before, whether we speak about drones, smart sensing, uh, wearables, the Internet of Things, web, 
uh, scrapping robotic process automation amount orders, big data analytics and artificial intelligence. So really important for regulators also uh, to use data to target intervention. The fifth one is to really leverage the role of a business, engage with business, industry-led governance mechanisms such as voluntary standard, uh, codes of conduct and industry convenience can also help deliver policy objectives more rapidly than regulatory intervention. And here also the European Union, uh, the European Commission has really developed principles to support the greater use of self and co-regulation approaches. The sixth point is to really to work across institutional boundary. And here technological innovations that are the hallmark of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, so also, need to the engagement of businesses uh, which can easily find themselves navigating a patchwork of regulations that deter them from introducing new idea products or business model. And here countries such as Denmark or Japan has introduced single points of contact uh, or one shop, one stop shops uh, to enable businesses to engage more straightforwardly with different national regulators on your ideas and therefore ensure that issues are tackled in a coordinated way. So the final point is really the uh, collaboration uh, and to collaborate internationally. And I think that um, Josh Pepper has brilliantly shown the, how critical it is to collaborate uh, in the context of artificial intelligence. So uh, by cooperating across border, regulator can really facilitate trade and investment and address shared challenges more efficiently and effectively. For example, plurilateral alliances have emerged in areas such as fintech or medicines, uh, while uh, in December last year, the government of Canada, Denmark, Italy, Japan, Singapore, uh, the UAE and the UK came together to establish the Agile Nations, a regulatory cooperation partnership that will uh, cover innovation ranging from green technologies to mobility. So let me finish by simply saying that uh, four lessons which come from the implementation of those uh, 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 pillars uh, include the engagement with the market because regulation is not the only barrier. It's also important to consider the capability, capital, culture, uh, those, uh, the sandboxes, the regulatory sandboxes should, should take those into consideration. It's also important to build on good practices. So uh, democracy, accountability, and inclusion have to remain uh, critical. Uh, care is needed to ensure that regulation remains proportionate, open, and fair. So it is also critical to think holistically. The seven pillars are mutually reinforcing. Uh, so, uh, and finally, to evaluate and learn. Dynamic process. Uh, so, so this is a dynamic process with the critical importance of monitoring evaluation among other factors. So I will stop there, but definitely the Biden administration should have outcome-focused regulation, uh, join up regulation and international regulatory uh, cooperation, testing initiative. So experimental uh, regulation will definitely be critical um, and inclusive, fair, open, uh, data-driven uh, for effectiveness and efficiency, and ultimately utilize multilateralism and cooperate globally. Thank you very much. Great, Th thanks Landry. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're running a little bit short for time. So I'm gonna ask um, one question uh, to all of the panelists. These are very rich papers. So time was needed to get through them. Um, and and you know, they're, they're obviously posted online. So please have a look there um, to see the full benefits of them. One theme I, I wanted to pick up, I, I mean, these papers are all delving into very important issues, though, though I think one thing which seems to cut across the papers in different ways here is certainly the role of the private sector um, in governance. And it, it comes across in a couple of different ways. So, Emily, um, you know, your, your, your focus on impact bonds obviously relies heavily on the private sector as, as a source of capital and possibly also expertise and delivery. And if you, if you could sort of address how you think about that in that piece, um, 
you know, Cam, obviously in the context of AI governance, um, the, the global partnership on AI is, is multi-stakeholder. So there's this multi-stakerism, um, which is, you know, very central for the US government and other governments when they think about AI governance. And here, the private sector is really a source of expertise. Um, and, and, and how do we think about the, the role of the private sector when we think about the, how, how we should be promoting international cooperation on AI? Um, George, for you, uh, the, the private sector is obviously um, a big player on the, on the development front in, in multiple ways, um, you know, both as a source of delivery, um, potentially a source of funding. Uh, what, how does USAID, how should USAID work with the private sector, leverage this expertise and capital more effectively when you think about building out USAID along the lines in your paper? And Landry, you've obviously touched on the private sector in multiple ways, um, in your paper, I love that example of Zipline to help deliver medicines by drone. I, I hope I've got that right. Um, but there's a lot there about how you think about how the private sector should cut across and be engaged in developing innovative regulation. Um, so if I maybe we'll just start, go through the order that everyone sort of made their presentations. If you just want to reflect on that, that would be great. Emily, over to you. Sure. Thanks, Josh. No, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's really you know, what impact bonds uh, have the potential to, to bring to the social services sector is, um, you know, the private sector working capital, upfront working capital for service providers, um, which addresses a liquidity constraint, as I mentioned, but also that sort of private sector discipline um, that, you know, that comes into social services delivery, um, whereas impact, impact investors, investors may engage directly with service providers, or um, they may hire performance management uh, intermediaries to work with the service providers, um, building up their systems of monitoring evaluation, performance management, et cetera. So, um, you know, there's a really important role that the private sector um, can play in the outcome-based financing space. Great, thanks. I know I know there's a lot there, and, and thank you for being short on, on that. And, and if we could all keep our, our responses similarly short, that'd be much appreciated. Um, George. Yeah, uh, Josh, the most of US assistance does not go to governments. It goes through NGOs and the private sector. Uh, I did a study a few years ago, and in the first uh, 15 years of this decade, AID engaged in over 1600 public-private partnerships. Uh, with something like uh, Power Africa, uh, AID over seven years expended maybe $500 million and it leveraged $56 million, $56 billion, $40 billion of which came from the private sector. So the private sector is heavily engaged in development, um, but they're frustrated with dealing with AID because of the slowness and the rigidity of AID processes. And Kristen, uh, right, uh, Susan Reichley and Steve Smith have put up a paper about a month ago, which goes through a litany of actions that AID could take to improve its relationships and engagement with the private sector that updates what I did four or five years ago. And I would uh, urge people to take a look at that paper. Excellent, thank you. Um, Cam, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, Josh, you mentioned multi-stakeholderism uh, and that really has been uh, an essential component of sorry, US tech policy making. It is integral to the NIST frameworks uh, that I mentioned. Uh, um, you know, it is integral to standards uh, development, uh, which really operate you know, through uh, voluntary consensual uh, and consensus based uh, approaches uh, using expertise. And I think that is critical to the various AI dialogues. I, you know, it is encouraging that that's incorporated in global partnership uh, uh, on AI uh, to do the OECD work. Uh, uh, and that needs to be a continued uh, feature. And I think, you know, you certainly, the private sector, but expertise more broadly uh, civil society, uh, academia. Um, and I think with a focus on what, uh, what Landry talked about is, you know, uh, output focused, uh, uh, regulation. Um, so, you know, really, um, uh, focusing less on process and much more on outcomes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's, that's excellent. Uh, Landry in, in 30 seconds or less. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I think Cam has uh, said or uh, anticipated on what I would have uh, said. So definitely multi-stakeholder uh, uh, collaboration is critical. A shift from shareholder to uh, stakeholder uh, capitalism and the engagement uh, as well uh, with uh, the public sector, uh, with the public sector, and uh, numerous other players to con players to continue innovations, which will address uh, the challenges that the world is facing while complying or participating. Uh, to the creation of the new regulation, and finally self-governance, industry uh, governance uh, to prevent uh, uh, poor practices. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I think that concludes our event. Um, I want to thank everyone for um, participating, all the scholars for contributing what I think are really a very rich series of blueprint papers. Um, they're all up online, so please go and have a look at them. And thank you all, the audience, for um, you know, being along for this journey. And um, I'll call the event to a close. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.